Welcome to the Interesting Podcast with Jedi Brian, episode number 37. This is Tom Wilton. Tom Wilton is a delight. I mean, like, I, of course he is. He's best friends with Derek Arnold, friend of the show, who's also awesome. And man, did we hit it off. It was such a good time. Uh, we So normally these shows run about, they run about an hour, typically, because an hour is like a pretty good time. Um, we talked for two and it, time just flew by. I mean, he's just the greatest uh, and has some of the best stories ever. I mean, we talk we talk a lot about traveling, which you'll notice is a common theme in a lot of my shows. But Tom, with the Walking with Dinosaurs exhibit, he went to Japan. So we talk about that. He has a, <laughs> he has a great story about uh, how he decided to climb Mount Fuji and, more importantly, how he got back down. Uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll hear that. Uh, we talk about how he got into acting, uh, his time on War Horse with Derek Arnold as well, uh, how he got involved in Star Wars. We talk about the he was the front legs of the Lugga Beast, and he he decided to do a little little bit of training for for that, and how that panned out is pretty great. Uh, but Tom Wilton, I mean, guys, he was the Lugga Beast. He was BU4D. He was Ponda Baba in Rogue One. Poor Gullet. He was, <laughs> he was a Thala Siren, which uh, for those that don't know, that's the sea cow that uh, <laughs> that Luke Skywalker milks in Episode Eight. Yeah, Tom and Derek are in that, which is gold. It's some of the best stories, and I was laughing out loud this whole show. Um, he was also uh, Borgwell Tomder, who was the stable master from Episode Eight. And in this episode, you find out uh, if it was Tom who beat the children or beat the fathers. <laughs> and uh, it's just some of the best stories I've heard. Uh, definitely check out his uh, YouTube channel with Derek Arnold. It's called The Drive-In with Tom and Derek. It's great. It's both of them uh, actually driving to Pinewood Studios every day. It's fun little internet videos. They are great guys. Like, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate their time and how much fun they are just as people. Uh, but yeah, it's just... Man, every now and then, like, you'll have some conversations, Tom and Derek are definitely no exception, where you'll just really connect with people, and it, it's just, it's just great. It's just great. You will, you are, you guys are going to love it. There's so many great stories in this, and I can just gush all day about it. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to let it over. I'm going to let you guys listen to it. But first, um, if you wouldn't mind, if you enjoy this, Go to iTunes, assuming that's where you're listening to this. Um, if not, search Jedi Brian on iTunes and you'll find this show. Uh, if you wouldn't mind giving it five stars, you don't have to write a review. Just five stars is fine because that uh, puts us in the iTunes algorithm and it makes the show easier to find for people and also helps book guests. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll do some sort of giveaway type thing when we hit uh, milestone numbers or whatever. I don't know. If you l- Let me know what you think about this. Um... Definitely follow Tom on Twitter, Tom K. Wilton, and uh, you'll get all his plugs at the end. But you guys are going to love this. I, I'm so excited. Uh, so without further ado, here is uh, The Interesting Podcast, episode number 37, with actor, creature performer, puppeteer, all-around great dude, Tom Wilton. Theme song time. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Tom, how are you? Hey, Brian, how are you doing? I'm very good. It worked. It worked. It worked. It's it's always uh, it's always iffy with technology. Yeah, I bet. I yeah. bet. Do you know what I had to do actually? I had to um I had to re-download, uh, re-download Skype actually, um because I haven't actually, had, you know, I've not used it for a while. So, and I suddenly kind of thought I sort of went online and I did, you know, sort of created an account again and did all that kind of stuff and then i suddenly thought just before i got your um twitter message i was like oh hang on a minute i think i actually need to download skype (laughs) (laughs) 
I actually need the application on my computer. <laughs> I have had to re-download Skype so many times because I forgot my password. Oh, it's been yeah, the yeah. worst. <laughs> that that is pretty much the story of my life across every medium. So like email accounts and like like everything. I'm just like I'm hopeless with that kind of stuff. <laughs> I kind I kind of wish that someone would invent some kind of app that just kind of had it all in one place. I mean, I know that would be quite dangerous, but at the same time, it would be very useful for guys like me. <laughs> yes, very true. I, I've I've had like my my new system is I have the same password but mixed up like for everything. So it's one of four options yeah. using the same characters. Now that's that's a good idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> And it's like weird ones too. It's like numbers and letters. What, some of them I'll have the letters first. Some I'll have the numbers first. Some I'll mix it up. But it's always one of four. Because yeah. by the end, you're just like making up candy names to try and think of something you'll remember. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. God, it gets so frustrating. It really is. It really is. How's your day going? Yeah, not too bad. I'm just uh, <laughs> I'm currently wading through the uh, my, dread, my dreaded sort of tax return, which... Um, over here in the in the UK is due at the end of this month, oh. so uh, yeah. So that's um, that's uh, they say they have they have a nice ta- a tagline over here. It's tax is not taxing, but the truth is it's um, yeah. <laughs> it really is. It's false advertisement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Does it work so, the yeah, same that's, way that's... over there, where you get like a form in and then you have to fill it out and then you get returns through that? Like over here, we get what's yeah. called like a W two. Ah, okay. Interesting. No, we, we sort of, we have a kind of, um, uh, HMRC, Her Majesty, Her Majesty's Revenue and Costumes essentially have like, um, uh, an online sort of service where you have an account on there and you log on and then you file your return online. Um, and then you just, yeah, you just do it all on there and you essentially, you pay it and, and sort of, as long as you do it by the 31st of January, then you're kind of okay. Yeah. Okay, we have. I think we get our returns like the W twos. It says how much we made that we have to do. We get that around now ish, and we have until April. Uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Get, we get a little more time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you're in London. Yes, that's right. right. That's correct. Right on. What part? Because I've learned there's a lot of parts in London. <laughs> there are a few different parts. So I am actually very, very close to Derek Arnold. Um, so I'm in South East London. So we're about um, uh, probably, you know, in, in a car journey, maybe five minutes away from each other. Ah, that's awesome. Yeah. So we quite often, when we go over to the studios in West London, we quite often car share. Yes. Uh, just to kind of sort of, you know, better for the environment, also save on petrol and stuff like that. That's the way we, uh, we you know, we see it. But uh, and also we get to we get to make our silly um, uh, drive-in sort of uh, videos as well, which is cool. Yes, you do. I'm number one fan of that. <laughs> I know you're. I know you're, you're. You're you're a sort of a real supporter, and we're very grateful to that. That's right. I'm I'm that guy. That's just on everything. Like, this was great. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> we need that positivity. We need it in the world. That's right. You're, you're very brave to drive in London. You know, um, <laughs> I, you know I felt that way, Brian, until, until um, I was doing a job in India. Oh. And then every other driving experience I had ever had just paled in comparison. Uh, <laughs> Because I was like, this is just crazy. Um, like the the you know, like they'll have a they'll have a motorway and there'll be there'll be like four or maybe five lanes on this motorway, but actually, it, it turns into nine lanes because what happens is is that cars just they just go for the gaps. So you've got this constant kind of stream of traffic that is just kind of moving through these unbelievably tight spaces, and then when you get into the cities. Um, the distances uh, of citizens and pedestrians away from the vehicles too. Mm. I, I just I couldn't believe it. You had like kids walking in the kind of gutters and they'd have cars, I mean, you know, literally sort of zooming by right next to them and no one would even sort of bat an eyelid, you know, whereas over here, you know, we, <laughs> you know, we all take our children, we've got the pavements or sidewalks as you call them, we get our children and we, we put them on the inside of us away from the road and if they go anywhere near it, we shout at them, you know, and it's kind of like, whereas uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a very a very different um, 
I guess, a, a different level of kind of health and safety or um, a, a sort of approach to sort of health and safety out there. Um, but yeah, so I used to think I was pretty brave, brave driving in London. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm just like, no, no. <laughs> I've, I've seen terrifying videos of uh, India's like massive roundabouts and it's just oh, constant man. traffic going on. I, I can't imagine. Yeah. Can't. can't. I drove all, all through Ireland. Uh, Did you? Yeah, I think it was last year. I mean, we logged like... We saw all of Ireland. <laughs> we landed in Dublin and then did the full circle, like Port McGee, Dingle, Galway, Donegal, Belfast, back to Dublin. It was like uh, thirteen hundred miles. Wow, incredible! But there, I mean, there's so there's so many roundabouts, and yeah. in America we don't have a whole lot of those. Everything is four way stops. So we're yeah. like, like, when do you get in? What lane do you get in? We're like looking at the map they gave us at the airport. Like, okay, if you're going full around, go to the third lane. It, uh, it was an interesting experience, <laughs> but London. Yeah, and, I, and I, also, I guess you're driving on you're driving on the other side of the road because I find when yes. I go onto the continent, roundabouts are an issue for us because of course you're driving you're you're approaching them so you end up going around them the wrong way which which yeah. instantly <laughs> you just as soon as you approach the roundabout you just have this absolute moment of panic where you're like which which way round do I go which way round do I go oh god and you know and you, and you just have to commit oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just go just do it quick do it quick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just hope that you've gone gone the right, you know the right way around. Oh, um, that other that's great. You must have seen. Oh, well, I mean, you must have sort of. Did you feel that when you were there, you saw uh, that the, the different areas that you went to, that the, uh, the the culture changed at all? I mean, you saw so much of Ireland. Absolutely, and that was the big thing. Is like I the thing I wasn't prepared for was the different in accents, in yes. in, in all different parts. So like. When it, typically, when you think of an Irish accent, it's the Dublin accent. That's correct. Right. Yeah. We went there, and then we went from there straight to Port McGee. And yeah. Port McGee is like, you know, it's where you take the boat to Skellig Michael. And yes. from there, like, I couldn't understand a word. <laughs> there is a bunch of like, old Irish fishermen. And I went to a pub and just sat there and, like, eavesdropped to try and, like, get the words. I got yeah. something about a fish. Everyone else got it, thought it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a word did I get. Uh, then you get like Belfast where everything is like super drawn out. And you're like, yeah. oh, this is so different. And a tiny little island. It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's amazing. Really, really small. Yeah. I had a, we had a fun experience. We did um, uh, in 2013, 12 to 13, mm -hmm. um, I did the, uh, the UK, um, Europe and Japan tour of Walking with Dinosaurs. What? The arena, the arena spectacular. And when we were in Ireland, we we the two we the two places that we played in uh, in the north of Ireland we played Belfast, and then in Ireland we played um, in Dublin. And we went literally from Belfast to Dublin, and it was extraordinary. Like the the, the differences and the reactions of the audiences. I mean, it felt like it really felt like it were the two different countries. I mean, I'm mean, sorry, they are they are two different countries, but like <laughs> the sense of the sense of like a, a really different set of people. Like in Belfast, the, the you know there was you know like the, there wasn't <laughs> there didn't seem to be a lot of enjoyment. Like you know <laughs> there wasn't a lot of clapping and cheering and laughing sure. at any of the jokes and things. Um, you know, and then because you know Belfast, you know, I, I mean, I found on on my first visit there, I found it to be. Um, quite a hard place yes uh, you feel as though and actually at the time that we were there they had just had a resurgence in some rioting sure. so so there was a so there was quite a tense atmosphere everywhere you went in the city um but then of course we, the next place we went to was dublin and it was an absolute riot you know like everyone's like laughing and cheering and you know sort of having the most amazing time and and, and it was just really crazy for us because to see, you know, uh, two sets of different audiences who are separated, really not not by very much distance at all, yeah, like but four hours. such a different experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally, yeah. To have such a different experience of um, of the work, uh, yeah, I found I found that fascinating. Yeah, it's nuts. It just goes to show, like how people get together, even on such a small island. Like how different cultures can be in like pockets. You know, yeah. you have, like you said, I mean, Northern Ireland was like a battleground for a bit where Dublin yeah. is like you've got the songs in the pubs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. And the, and, and the crack, as they say. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. everyone's up to crack. Yeah, it's so fun. It's so fun. I love yeah. Ireland. 
Oh, it's it's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, when we were filming um, filming there last year for the Last Jedi, mm-hmm. uh, we were so lucky because we had, um, and all of, all the locals were saying, you know, for that time of year, uh, you know, the weather. They were like, it's it's never this good. I mean, <laughs> you know, like it was extreme, like clear blue skies, sunshine. I mean, really, really hot. Um, wow. You know what? Well, one of my memories is I think a lot of ice cream was consumed, you know, yeah, sure. <laughs> which, tells, you know which tells you, you know, what, what the weather was like. Um, and we were we were staying on Dingle Beach. Um, uh, so, th- uh, yeah, just th- this amazing kind of sandy uh, beach that stretched for miles and miles and miles. And I remember, you know, we took lots of walks down there and yeah, just just yeah, just the weather was just great. Amazing. That's 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 the give and take of it. Like. You have this like beautiful green pastures. You're like it's green because it rains every day, <laughs> for, absolutely forever. Yeah, <laughs> when they yeah, see the, when fun. they see the sun, they're like, "What is that light up there? I don't understand." <laughs> it's <Yeah>. So rare. <laughs> yeah, like oh, it's the sun. That's ah. right. It it burns. <laughs> yes, it's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where yeah. Are, are you from, London? Uh, no, originally um, I grew up in uh, in the university town of Cambridge. Oh, okay. Right on. That's where I was born and bred. So I, I lived there until I was about sort of 17, 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I moved down to London to university and I've been here in London ever since. Gotcha. Okay. What was it like growing up in Cambridge? It, it was pretty, there? pretty <laughs> idyllic. Yeah, pretty idyllic, really. Um, uh, Cambridge is, um, is quite a bit smaller than Oxford. Um, they look, I mean, they look very similar in their sort of architecture, uh, but, but Cambridge is a bit smaller, a bit quainter. Um, so yeah, I mean, and everyone cycles everywhere. It's a little bit like Amsterdam in that sense. Sure. Um, so you can you can get everywhere, but it's not a very big place. You can get most places by bike. Um, and um, yeah, it was it was just a very nice, very safe place to grow up. And I don't think I really really appreciated um, quite how pretty it was as a town actually until I moved away because you know you grow up somewhere and you just go oh you know this is just this is where I you know this is where I'm growing up you know and you don't you don't really appreciate that and then when you move away you know when you know the times that I've been back since I've been like wow this this town (laughs) is beautiful (laughs) sure and uh, what how big was the culture shock to go from like tiny Cambridge to London well, you know what? Actually, it wasn't too bad for me. My brother and I. So, so my my mum lived in Cambridge, and my dad lived in London. Actually, in North London, in in, oh, okay. in a relatively in a relatively rough part of North London. Mm-hmm. Um, so we would we would sort of uh, come down maybe every other weekend to London and stay with my dad, um, and and just be terrified. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like terrified to leave the house because it was you know. Uh, so actually, by the time I got down, you know for university i actually kind of you know i felt like um i had uh, a fairly good measure of the place but i think if i if i come straight from cambridge to london then yes i think um sure. i think it would have been a bit of a shock you're able to dip your toes in and like test the waters first Be like oh yeah. this is what it's like as opposed to boom you're here exactly this is what it's like to use the london underground <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> which is the greatest public transportation ever do you think so? I do, because in America we don't have anything quite like that, and what we do isn't as nice, which is saying something. <laughs> well, you know, actually, just um, uh, just before uh, just before Christmas, mm-hmm. I was uh, I was out in New York for a week. Um, yes, and okay. so I was I was kind of getting you know f- you know finding my feet on the New York subway, um, and uh, you know a lot of it's very different. But one of the things that that, that strangely actually felt quite familiar was how aggressive people can be <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> very very so much that kind of sense of like don't get in my way i'm on I'm, you know i'm traveling somewhere i've got to get there you yes. know xb uh I, you know for work or whatever you know you just have to sort of let people people get where they have to get to you know yes. um so I, I was there with my son who is uh, who is six? He'll be turning seven uh, tomorrow. Actually, he's turning seven tomorrow. Oh, happy birthday! Um, and yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. So there was a lot of kind of like grabbing him and kind of scooping him up out of the way, sort of in, <laughs> in, a, in a similar way that I do on the London Underground to make sure that he wasn't getting trampled by people. Sure. Um, so yeah, weirdly, that that kind of it felt quite familiar and nice. <laughs> there you go. You've been, you've been training your whole life for this. <laughs> you have a lot yeah. of practice back home. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I yeah. was I was unprepared for the size of London when I was there. 
Wow, okay. Like, hey. like it was one of those things because when I did it, it was it was a big trip. It was like over the course of two weeks or so. We did like mm. a week and a half in Ireland, and then we took the ferry from Dublin to Wales, and then went to Chester and took the train from Chester to London. Wow, that's that's a really interesting route. Yes, it was it was uh, it was interesting. Uh, don't go to sleep in a Wales train station. They don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, pro tip. <laughs> don't. Do which that. um, which, which part of where? Which which station it was, was uh, it? Hollyhead. Ah, uh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we we. What happened was we missed the the like seven o'clock ferry out of Dublin, and we had to catch the one that was around midnight. Ah, uh, uh, right. So we got into Hollyhead at like four, three, four in the morning, and then there's just nothing of anything anywhere and our train to chester left at like seven in the morning so i was like i'm just gonna find like a corner and just like sleep for a little bit and they're like yeah. no homeless people sleeping here and i was like no we're traveling <laughs> and, can't understand them. <laughs> and they weren't and they weren't sort of um and they weren't very accommodating no uh not so much oh, not in this shame. instance but that's it, a shame it was more just poor planning on my part but <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah. went there and when I mean, you hear London and you're like, OK, it's going to be a big city. It's like one of the biggest. But then I guess it's because America, you know, we have this idea that everything's huge here. We're like, yeah, we got Texas and New York City. And <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, so wrong. So wrong thinking that we had big things because granted, London's had, you know, hundreds of years to grow. Uh, but wow, huge. He was unprepared for just the magnitude of that city. The first thing we did was did the the London Eye, yeah. And uh, you know you get all the way up there and you're like, I can't see the end of this place. Bonkers, <laughs> bonkers. We stayed in uh, Hammersmith. And oh, place, did you? Yeah, okay, yeah. There's a place like right off the underground where there's like hostel that we stayed at, which is yeah, uh, yeah. It was amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I you know I I felt sort of I felt a similar kind of feeling when uh, when I went to Tokyo for the first time. Yeah, what was that like? Um, Oh, just, I mean, just amazing, just crazy. Um, but in a similar kind of way, the, 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 the size, the magnitude of, of Tokyo is just, I mean, the fact that the first, <clears throat> again, this was on the Walking with Dinosaurs tour, yeah. the first, um, the first uh, place that we went to was um, Shin Yokohama, um, which uh, I, oh, I'm, hoping, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping I'm getting this right, I believe. <laughs> Um, Shin Yokohama is it's a it's a city unto itself. Um, in fact, I believe it's the second largest city really? after Tokyo, but it's still considered a Tokyo uh, a suburb of Tokyo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like that's how like the second largest city is still essentially a suburb of Tokyo, which crazy. I was just like like just to get from there. I mean, it was crazy. And then when, yeah, when you're in Tokyo, like. Um, yeah, we found when we were when we were doing a little bit of sightseeing, you you had to choose your area, and that was the area that you were going to do that day because it would take you a good day just to kind of do all the things that you wanted to do in that particular area. Sure. Um, yeah, just just, but also like uh, just everything about Japan, I just found such a such an amazingly positive kind of culture shock. It was just wonderful and crazy, and yeah, yeah, really, really, really enjoyed my time there. That's like toward the top of my list of places I'd like to travel to. I've always been like obsessed with Japanese culture. Yeah. And just like, I mean, it's nuts. It's so old and there's so much going on. And I feel like Tokyo is like this crazy place where like ideas come out of your brain and just appear. There's like robot bars and like yeah. vending machines for shoes. You're like, what is happening? I'm so into all it. of that <laughs> stuff is yeah that's that's all the kind of the the, the the weirdest and wackiest and the best stuff about Tokyo like you you have um yeah and, and like you were saying about how old it is as well it's this amazing kind of clash of of ancient meets modern yeah. um, and there's still obviously there's still all that that reverence and 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 respect for uh for, for for the old ways but yet at the same time you know they're like rapidly running you know sort of in a, in a forwards direction with technology and so yeah. i mean just trying to use just trying to use a toilet out there is <laughs> <laughs> it's just you know you got i mean it's like it's like a, it's like a space it's, it's like a space capsule you go into it and you're like um you know i don't i don't <laughs> 
you know, like, uh, you know, like, you know, there, there are parts of that. Like, sometimes when you're on a Star Wars set and you're in amongst, you know, like, on a spaceship or something, you go, oh, that reminds me of a Tokyo toilet, you know. I don't even know where to go. <laughs> exactly. I don't even know, but, you know, they're like, there's like a gazillion buttons. And what am I supposed to press? What shouldn't I press? That's right. You know, but, um, what is the seatbelt here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That yeah. is crazy. Uh, so it's yeah it's and it has yeah it's just oh it's just it's a fabulous place i would i would love to go back i would love sure, to go back and, sure. and obviously you know uh, you know when you when you get further away from tokyo what you also get is another kind of experience because the pace of life is a lot slower and you and you start to kind of get a feel for rural japan and sure. um and in, uh, yeah i mean it, just like we were saying about ireland you know it's uh I felt as when we traveled through the different areas of Japan, you, you really got a sense of how, you know, region to region, you know, the peoples were very different and they had their, their own idiosyncrasies and, and, you know, and that was, again, that was a challenge because each place you were going to, you were kind of having to, to work out what to do and what not to do. Right. Right. And over there's very traditional and very, like you said, about yeah. the, about, about the respect. And with yeah. slightly different flavors of the culture. Yeah, that's very interesting. Exactly. Like when we first arrived there, we were doing what we would do, you know, in, in, in London, really, in regards to sort of eating on public transport. You know, on on, sure. on the London Underground, people, you know, they, they, yeah, they're they rushing around places and often they're eating lunch on the go. And, and so they're, mm-hmm. they're eating on trains and they're eating on the tube and things like that. And so we were just doing the same until we suddenly started to realize that we were getting some kind of funny looks from people when we were on the underground uh, or, or on sort of the, the trains there. And mm-hmm. so we, we sort of, I think maybe we checked at the hotel or something and they told us, yes, yeah, so or it's actually, it's considered to be quite rude to eat when you're on public transport. Oh, okay. So from then on we were like, right. Okay. And it, and that's not to say that, you know, it's really interesting. That's not to say that Japanese people don't, don't yeah, of course. eat. In the same way that, like, we, you know, you, you have to get lunch quickly. They do, but they just, they just do it sitting down in a restaurant. It's extraordinary. Like, if you go to a, a like a ramen restaurant, you'll sit down, and, and by the time you finished your bowl of ramen, uh, the seats either side of you will have been, you know, occupied, and then, and then someone's left, like maybe like two or three times because people wow. come in, all gets put down in front of them, and they just inhale the food it's <laughs> you never see anything like it it's extraordinary like the, they just whoop, the noodles go in and then whoop, the broth goes down and then they're out the door and it's so they so it's not that they don't do the whole kind of eating on the go eating in a rush kind of thing it's just it's the, it's not the done thing on on public transport so it's all those little things that you kind of you start to kind of learn as you travel around a new place which i find and that's the stuff that i really enjoy i find it really exciting For sure. i totally agree I, i'm the same way i like to go off the beaten path uh, to experience like the culture, you know, like the real people kind of stuff. Did you yeah. Get, did, that's that's crazy. So you you had ramen in Japan. Yeah. How was yeah. it? Oh, it's just amazing. It's like and and again, thing. another thing that I didn't realize was that each you know each ramen joint that you go to, they all have their own particular recipe for the broth. Really. Every single one has it has has their own special recipe for the broth so so you're getting you know every every different ramen restaurant you go to you're getting a different experience each time you go wow that's awesome yeah yeah isn't that fantastic yeah did you did you ride a bullet train yeah we did oh yeah we took bullet trains uh to most of the different kind of areas that we went to and again that's that's extraordinary one of the one of the craziest things about that is the seats i mean it, you know the fact that they're able to kind of swivel essentially they just swivel the, the seats in the direction of travel really yeah so the train will pull into so it will go to its destination and rather than have to do a thing where you're turning the train around or, or people are then facing the wrong way uh essentially there's this uh, the guard goes through and there's these little locking mechanisms under the sets of seats and they swivel all the chairs around so they're now facing in the direction of travel and then the train goes off in the other direction wow. <laughs> that's great yeah it's that, crazy. that's why they inhale their food so quickly because they're on the precipice of everything just making exactly. it more advanced yeah 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 wow yeah that is crazy that's yeah. so that's also sounds similar to ireland in that like the, so you've got like the big cities, you know, Dublin, mm-hmm. Belfast, Galway, but outside of that, it's just rural farmland and like sparsely yes. populated. Absolutely. 
That's so yeah. cool. So what was the coolest thing you did in Japan? Oh, I asked the hard that, questions. Here. Okay, now you're asking what's the coolest <laughs> thing that we did in Japan? Right. Um, I like to make you feel comfortable and then just hit you with the hard ones. Oh, straight in there. <laughs> um, I think, uh, do you know, one of the things that really stands out to me was there, uh, there was, there's a, a place called the Kiso Valley mm-hmm. and there is an old postal trail that exists there where they essentially have preserved the, um, the buildings so that it looks the same as it looked um, from kind of feudal, feudal Japanese times. So kind of 16th of the century. So you, so you walk this beautiful kind of Valley trail um, and in amongst some absolutely stunning forests, there are also these beautiful little um, towns uh, which which looked like they would have done in the 1600s, and so you, you kind of feel like you're stepping onto the set of a Kurosawa film. Sure. Um, and I'm a I, you know I love the films of of, of Kurosawa, so Same. so that that for me I think probably that for me was a real highlight because um, the walk was beautiful and you know there were some waterfalls and it was so hot that we were able to kind of climb in and out of the waterfalls and that was a real highlight. No, it's actually you know I'll tell you what actually here's here's the real highlight I think yeah. actually I was. T- my son was asking me to sort of um, relive this story for him the other day. Um, I think it was the second, maybe the second day that we got to Tokyo, we decided that we were going to climb Mount Fuji. What? Um, and we, 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 our team, there's a team of six of us. And as a, you know, our job on the show was essentially to operate the smaller dinosaurs the dinosaurs that you could actually climb inside, puppeteer. Uh, we do a lot of running in them, you know, running them around the, the arena and things like that. So they were one-man suits, mm-hmm. um, but they were heavy. They were very heavy. I mean, the heaviest one that we did, I think, was somewhere between 40 and 45 kilograms. Mm. So um, <clears throat> quite a lot to, to be sort of trying to sprint with when you're yeah. in <laughs> the legs of an arena. Um so we used to do a lot of training and, and there was, a, you know, there was, a, there was an element of bravado to our team and, you know, that sense of like guys together trying to sort of one upmanship physically. And so yeah. <laughs> we hadn't, when we got to um, where you begin to sort of climb Fuji, um, we, we hadn't really left ourselves enough time. Uh, and the recommended time was six hours and we only had four. Mm. And that was four before the last bus that went for the last train that would take us back to Tokyo. Um, <clears throat> so what did we do? Uh, we, uh, ra- you know, rather than sort of abandon the trip. Of no, no. <laughs> we decided we were going to try and run up Mount Fuji. Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we were like, right, let's do this. Um, so, uh, oh, you know, off we went. And uh, and I don't, I, I don't know how we didn't end up with altitude sickness. I don't know. But somehow... <laughs> Somehow we made it to the top and then we started to make our way down. And somewhere on the way down, I got separated from the rest of the group. Oh, no. Um, and I I think I must have missed a turning or something. And then all of a sudden, I found myself in this kind of dense forest at the base of, of, <laughs> of Mount Fuji. And I believe I believe they call this this the uh, the forest of um, – I think they call it the forest of forgotten souls or something like that oh, no. because – it's a, it's a, it's a popular, this is rather macabre, but it's a popular destination. It's the suicide for, forest. Absolutely. It's yes, the suicide I've heard of it. You know, yeah. You've heard of it. Oh no. Yeah. So, so I essentially, and it's very, it's a very eerie forest. And I, and I understand that I, I heard that essentially there's a, there's something about twine, like people that go to die in the forest will tie twine to the first tree they come to. And then they will kind of unspool it as they go in case they change their mind so they can kind of find wow. their, their way back because, and I understand now, you know, why there would be that logic applied to it because it's a very, very dense forest and it's, and it's really eerie and quite creepy and particularly as the light was, it was dusk and the light was fading and there were these wind chimes and sort of uh, strange kind of pits that had been dug into the earth. And, and I was sure. getting, really, <laughs> I was really freaked out and I was totally lost. And I, and, I, and, I, and I knew that I had a very limited amount of time before I could actually, um, I could actually sort of get, um, get back to the coach. So I was calling my buddies and going, I don't know where I am. And they were going, what can you see? And I was going, all I can see is forest. I don't know how I'm going to get out of here. No. Um, and then I just had to sort of just, just choose 
a, a route in the hope that it was going to take me to where I needed to be. And I was sort of at that point I was running and it got really dark. So I remember I, I must have tripped and fallen about three or four times, but <laughs> I was right back up onto my feet. And, and anyway, somehow I made it back to the bus. I got on there and I sort of got and, and the guys were like, ah, oh, you made it. And then I literally kind of collapsed. And the next thing <laughs> I knew, the train station. Um, but the next day was our opening night for Tokyo for, for the whole for the beginning of the Japanese tour so that the tour wow. was there and it was a packed out stadium in, in in Japan and and so and but that morning we used to do these things called suit camps where where essentially uh we would build up our endurance inside the suits um sure. uh, you know we do like run back and forth and we do you know lunging exercises and all these kinds of things inside the suits and the the director that was looking after the show uh, I know uh, maybe he had it in for me that day or something. Maybe he'd heard about our, our, our sort of our climb the, the previous day, but I was in the heaviest suit, the Lillian Sternis puppet. And I was, he was making me lunge backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and backwards. And my legs, I was like, Oh my goodness. After having climbed or, you know, run up Fuji the day before my legs, <laughs> I can't, I, they, they, literally I can't do, do this much more. And it just so happened that I was also doing the Lillian Sternis puppet in the opening show that night. So lo and oh, behold, man. we get to the moment when the Lillian Sternis has to kind of lunge forwards at the, uh, uh, at the other dinosaur that's chasing it oh, no. uh, lunge forwards and then leap back. And as I stepped backwards, my legs went, no, I'm sorry. We've had enough. <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing this anymore. And so I, and so I just completely stacked it and fell over. And it was the only time on that tour that I actually fell over inside one of the dinosaurs. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, it, and of course, it's on the opening night with the promoter watching, and it's and it's really undignified because <laughs> you have to lie there. You lie there, and you can't you can't get out of it yourself. You can't stand it back up. Oh no! Um, so two technicians have to come on, and they have to walk over to you, and they have to help you get back up again. Um, oh, but. No. <laughs> the, the, sort of the, the place in the arena when that particular sequence happens is right at the other end of the arena and the technicians that come on they're not allowed to run because it will it may sort of It'll draw show, attention yeah it will it may show the audience that something like they may worry about the person inside the suit so they have to walk right. very casually so they <laughs> so <laughs> just laying there <laughs> so just lying there forever while these two guys casually kind of walked over <laughs> And then picked me back up and put me back on my feet. And then I carried on, did the rest of the sequence and came off and felt very sorry for myself. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was the only time, the only time that I fell over. But, it, of course, it had to be the opening night in Japan. So, of course. Yeah. When else are you going to do it? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> that is amazing. You, you realize that story, like, is something people write for movies. <laughs> you're like you're like Mount Fuji. How much time we got? Zero. Challenge accepted. And then you end up in the suicide forest, tripping over yourself the day yeah. before. Usually, that's like you do your run, and then you're like, okay, now let's experience this place we've been we've been performing in. But you're like, no, yeah. no, let's do this the day before. <laughs> Just yeah. a dinosaur falling over in the show. Oh, <laughs> perfect. You know, that was the kind of that, like I was saying about the kind of bravado. That was the kind of crazy stuff that we used to do on sure. that on that tour. <clears throat> when we went to we went to Oslo, we went to Oslo um, quite early on actually in the tour. And at that stage, we were still in the sort of the mentality of doing these really extreme workouts to try and make our legs stronger. And I remember one of our we used to call them uh, the two guys that were kind of running our team. We used to call them the suit captains. And one of our suit captains, a uh, uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, suit performer neil holmes um he he had been in the um or he trained to be uh in the commandos i think the the uh what was it the um uh what are the guys that jump out of planes paratroopers the paratroopers yeah that's it i think he was training to be a paratrooper really? and he during during his basic training he picked up this thing that they called the army crawl where you essentially you hook your thumbs into the back of your trainers and you do this kind of deeply uncomfortable kind of squat, <laughs> and the so we and then so we ran down to we to the uh, the Oslo Opera House, which has this amazing sloped roof which you can climb up and down. And we did these army crawls over and over and again up and down the um, the roof of the Oslo Opera House. And I'm not kidding that like for the next week I just I couldn't walk properly. It was it was just crazy. <laughs> 
one of one of my colleagues the next day fell down an escalator on the way to work because <laughs> <laughs> his, his legs wouldn't work. They just went, no, no I'm not. Are you, oh, you want to go down? No, we can't go down. And literally just, good dong, good dong, he fell down, yes. <laughs> it's like, come on, man, the stairs are the ones that do the moving. If you're going to yeah, fall, you yeah, fall down stairs. I know, you don't have to just, just, just let the stairs do all the work yeah. for you. <laughs> that's yeah. see, so, that's um, the real embarrassment, not falling exactly. over in a dinosaur. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, falling, falling, you know, falling down an escalator in a shopping centre. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that was, uh, that, yeah, that was the kind of sort of the crazy kind of things that we used to do on that tour. So, um, so I suppose it comes as no shock really that we decided to run up and down Mount Fuji. Of course. What else are you gonna do, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. So, when that's that's so cool, man. So you've done a lot of puppetry, but I know you were an actor first. So mm. I have to ask. When did you like know that you wanted to be an actor? When when did that start? Well, I have to confess, um, that happened that happened quite early on because uh, a number of my family are also in the business. Really? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my um, in fact, my um, uh, my uncle Terry Terence Wilton is um, currently playing the older character uh, in the West End production of The Woman in Black here in oh, London. Oh, sweet. Um, so, and, and really, I think it's probably, it's, if I, if I trace it back, it, it probably does come down to my uncle Terry really. Cause mm-hmm. my father, when we were kids, he used to take, uh, my brother and I to see everything that Terry was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> Terry worked a lot for the Royal Shakespeare company. Um, cool. so we, we'd often go up and down to Stratford to see the productions up there and, and, and we'd, yeah, dad would just take us around to wherever Terry was and, and we'd we'd go and watch him, and we'd go backstage and and see the dressing rooms and see the backstage of the theater. And I think that's really where I caught the bug for it. Sure. Um, thinking that I kind of wanted to follow in the footsteps of my of my uncle. Um, and he had, to, you know, he he told some he he's a great raconteur and, t- and tells some wonderful stories. And and that so that was really inspiring to me. So I think probably, I think you know, I think maybe maybe when I was like from the age of about eight or possibly nine i think i knew i think i knew that that's what i wanted to do mm-hmm. so quite early on like i remember thinking uh, you know uh, i remember f- in some ways i remember feeling quite lucky uh during my sort of high school years because i felt uh, as though I, I i was very focused on what i wanted to do because i knew what i wanted to do absolutely uh, and yeah so i look back and i think that was so when, you know, because academically I, I, I wasn't the best at school. I wasn't, I wasn't you know, uh, I wasn't very academically gifted. That's and right. I think what helped, what, what helped me, you know, what, what provided me with a sense of kind of focus and self-worth, I think, was the fact that I knew that this was what I wanted to do. And I felt as though I, I, I excelled in it. And so I think that was, um, for my self-esteem at the time, I think that was probably quite a good thing. Sure. I, I have this theory that like, because the average person in my experience doesn't know what they want to do for forever, sometimes into their 30s. They're like, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of trying stuff out, whatever. But there'll yeah. be people every now and then that I've known since they were children. They're like, this is something just clicked and they always knew. And I, I like to believe that dreams like that, that stick with you are the ones that are like almost meant to come to fruition. Because as a kid, you go through like, I want to be a cowboy, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be, like, you switch it up so often. But if there's ever a kid that's like, I've always wanted this thing, and I feel like goals, statistically, the more precise they are, the higher chance there is to achieve it. Because it's like, you have a specific goal as opposed to like, I want to be successful, which is so broad, it's hard to pin down to what that is. That's cool, though. That's really cool. So did you start in theater? Yes, I did. Yeah, I took a rather circuitous route to get there. I um, I, uh, I went to Brunel Uni. Well, actually, I was keen to go to drama school, but at the time, mm-hmm. um, drama school's over here, and actually, it's gone back that way now, or it's going more back that way. I think in terms of fees, um, but it was sure. very expensive. When I was about sort of seventeen, eighteen, it was very, very expensive to go to drama school. Sure. Um, and also, my mum. Again, my mum. She she went to a, a drama college as well and and sort of uh, was an actress for a year or so I think um, after she left before she kind of decided that, that it wasn't for her and so she understood the hardships of it so I think she was 
very keen that I that I get a degree, that I get a sense of academic kind of um, uh, foundation, as sure. you, uh, you know, just if you case. like. So, yeah, just in case, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I was very headstrong. I was like, no, this is what I want to do. I want to go to drama school. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the end, I ended up um, going and doing a degree <laughs> in experimental theatre. Oh, which there you was, go. <laughs> which, was, which was really interesting. And I, and I kid you not, you know, th- there were times when we actually were there, you know, pretending to be trees. I mean, that, that <laughs> was, it, was, it was that type of course. Gold. Uh, and you know, and I learned some some weird and wonderful stuff there. But it, and I'm I'm very grateful for my time there because it, it it definitely um, gave me that sense of uh, passion and love for for devised theatre. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 actually, it was there actually that I I first met someone that I work a lot with now, um, a fantastic puppeteer called Robin Guyver as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Robin Robin and I met at university, and then we've kind of had this weird sort of uh, journey where we've you know gone our separate ways for a little while and then we've come back together so we came back together on on war horse and we worked together on the stage production of war horse mm-hmm. and then we went our separate ways again and then we came back together um on star wars and and so we sort of you know we we keep kind of you know bumming and now of course we we work a lot together so so we have a sort of team and um, we do uh, do lots of uh, very specific kind of referencing puppetry and things, um, and and movement work for uh, uh, for films. So um, yeah, but um, yeah, so it was, it, I think it was a bit of a it was a bit of a circuitous route to get to being an actor because I I went and did the drama training at university and then I decided that I wanted to be be a playwright so I went and did some oh. uh playwriting for a while into the playwriting course mm-hmm. um uh, and then while I was there I felt a little bit like I was the actor amongst the playwrights um sure. and somebody said to me hey look it's never too late to go to drama school so then I applied for drama school and I went to um unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore sadly it closed uh, <laughs> Some you got what ago. you needed. I got. Well, I was, we literally, we were the last. We, I think, we were the last year group there before it closed. Um, the Weber Douglas Academy of Dramatic Art, um, and so I went and did a classical training there. A bit of classical actor, because of course that's what I wanted to do. You know, of I was course. a follower of my uncle Terry and become a an, an RSC actor. Sure. Um, uh, and so yeah, so then sort of graduated in it was about two thousand and six, I think. Um, uh, yeah, and then acted sort of professionally, mainly stage work, um, until about 2010, which is when I joined the cast of Warhorse. Aha! Uh-huh. So when you when you wanted to be an actor, you were like you, theater was like your main thing. You wanted to be on stage, or were you well, like anything? Well, I mean, I think as an actor, you uh, yeah, I think it's probably sensible to, to to sort of keep your options open. Sure. Um, uh, but. Just, so it happened that the majority of the work that I did was stage work. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And was Warhorse the first bit of puppeteering you did? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that was that, that was my first introduction to puppetry, really. Um, and uh, when I entered the show, I entered as sort of in the acting company, if you like. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and and Warhorse, the show is a very complicated show because you have, um, you know, you, as an actor, you have your part, but then you also have a number of cover responsibilities as well. Um, and because there's so much puppetry on that show, mm-hmm. a lot of your cover responsibilities involve puppetry. Really? So, yeah, absolutely. So when I entered the show, um, uh, myself and a, a, um, a fellow uh, friend and actor, uh, Matthew Forbes, who, who actually now is one of the puppetry directors um, for uh, the touring production of Warhorse, uh-huh. um, we were considered to be the the kind of the, the 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 Superman roles, if you like. So we we had our own little part in the show, but we essentially between both of us, we understudied and covered almost all of the other characters and also the um, uh, puppetry elements that weren't the big horses wow. as well. So we learnt we learnt a lot in a very short space of time, um, and I felt like it was a real crash course in puppetry because not mm-hmm. only were we doing because there, there are there are a couple of other um, like, like sort of big horses I guess which um, which are not operated by the main horse puppeteers. So you know, we we found ourselves climbing inside those, but then also we were doing smaller, more detailed puppetry like the little crow puppets that they have and the 
and the puppet soldiers which you hold over your your head for a long time mm-hmm. in the in the sort of the, the, the horse charges and all to all the other sort of little bits of puppetry that were going on around the kind of the periphery we we learned those so yeah it was a crash course in puppetry um and at the end of that first year I knew that I wanted to stay on with the production, mm-hmm. um, but I fancied a different challenge. And an opening came up on the on the big horse teams, and that's when I moved across to do the big horse puppetry. Um, uh-huh. So, so by the time I'd left, I felt like I I I'd sort of <laughs> yeah, you know got, you had a good show by that. <laughs> that's crazy. I didn't know there were those like uh, positions where like you cover everyone. Man. Yeah, most of most of, I mean, at that time when I entered the show, most of the performers had they had their role. Mm-hmm. They also then had a second cover responsibility, and then in some cases they would have a third cover responsibility as well. Wow. So it was like this. It was like this extraordinary complicated jigsaw puzzle because if an actor was on holiday or they were sick or injured, it was like this. Game, you know, you know those games of Connect Four where all the kind of pieces kind of fall through. It was like that. Like everything, everything had to shift down one, which meant that you know everyone had to then swap around and do something else. And and sometimes they would be doing their main part, but they would also be then be doing, you know, uh, their cover responsibility in the second half or something like that. So it it required you to really think on your feet. Um, sure. I mean, like. As soon as essentially, as soon as you were out of out of kind of rehearsal period for it, and the show was up and running, that was when holidays would start. And then every evening before the show would begin, we would we would go into this big circle. It would call the knock on circle, and almost every night something would be different. So it'd be like, okay, this person's doing this different thing, or someone's going to have to cover here. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm very grateful for that for that training in that sense because I think it it's yeah it, it it forces you to um to be resilient to think on your feet um to be able to sort of uh be flexible and, and react quickly yeah. and which which is a skill which i have to say has come in extremely handy on multiple occasions on film sets because you're often in a situation when you're having to do you know last minute something's changing right we've got to adapt to this we've got to we've got to you know make this work and um and uh, yeah, I think I probably honed that that sort of skill, if you like, um, during my time on Warhorse. That is amazing. And this was on the West End. That's correct. Yes, that was so, in the West End. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty amazing. You wanted to get into theater, and then slash forward, you're performing at the West End. Well done. <laughs> that, yeah, I mean, that definitely that was a big. You know, that was. I think for many of us that had been touring around the regions and things before, when you land your first West End part, there there is an yeah, there is an enormous sense of achievement to that. You feel yeah, you feel a bit giddy and excited and for a while you can't quite believe it. Um yeah. and then, you know, fast forward a year down the line and you're dragging yourself into work going, Oh God, I wish yeah. I was doing something else. <laughs> That is how it goes. The the uh it's like that saying, you know, a dream job is still a job. It's like, Absolutely. it's like when you Absolutely. do it, it's like it's a, it's a lot of work. You still got to go that's in there it. and perform. Yeah, you got it. You got it. That's a that's a great phrase because in the end, you know, even even yeah, some even doing something like Warhorse in the West End, or even you know the most amazing things that we do, you know, it, at, at the end of the day, at some point, you know, it still becomes a job. Sure, you know, a job is just a job. You know, yeah, absolutely. So when you when you got into the big horse. I know Derek was the back legs. Yep. What were you? So I was the I was the front legs. Aha! Uh-huh. You did both. How many, like how many people are in the big horse? So you have three. You have three puppeteers on the big horse. You have one um, on the actual outside of the horse puppeteering the head. Oh, uh, okay. That makes and sense. then you have two on the inside. Uh, one on the front legs and one on the back legs. Um, gotcha. And it's uh, and yeah, and it's and essentially you've got the three the three puppeteers. Is are all working together to try and essentially sync up their movements and, and harmonize in a way that, that leads the audience to believe that, that this is a, that it's one creature, one spirit, if you like. Right, right. So what was it like doing the front legs? We got the perspective of the back. <laughs> okay, so you had the back. Well, you see, the thing is, um, the, the, being the front legs um, can, can be sort of made an awful lot easier by a fantastic hind puppeteer by the back legs. Uh-huh. Um, I know. One. So, so 
You, you know, you do, you do know one, <laughs> right? Um, and I know him well too. And I have to say, um, you know, it, it's it, it's extraordinary uh, how, how how much of a difference that makes when you've got a a, a proactive, um, dynamic um, uh, puppeteer in the back like Derek who who is always on the front foot and is always giving you that energy that you need to get to the next position or engage in that particular sequence. And, Mm -hmm. um, so that was one aspect that, you know, how was it? Well, you know, if you had someone like Derek in the back, it was a joy, um, (laughs) you know, because, because I had this, it had this great energy. Um, and you know, it's, it's interesting. They're, they're, they're interesting puppets, the Warhorse puppets. Um, they're, they, they require, a lot of your body in a very specific kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the front legs, because of the trigger mechanisms, you and 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 the way that you had to operate the trigger mechanisms and raise the way that you would raise your arm, you essentially would develop these very strange muscles on your arm. But you you couldn't possibly train those in the gym. The only <laughs> way that you could really develop the stamina. To, to 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 do the show for two hours every night was by was just by doing it you know you just had to right. get in there first and so at the beginning of the process i mean you know the horse looks in a really bad way <laughs> <laughs> you know, legs kind of flopping all over the place sure. because the tears are there, you know you just they just don't have the the specific strength to to be able to operate these mechanisms in the way that you need to mm-hmm. um and I would say even by the time we opened, you know, I still didn't feel like I, the, the strength was, was quite there in the right way. But then suddenly, you know, I can't remember how long it was, maybe two or three months into the, the, the run. Suddenly you kind of go, oh, OK, right now I'm beginning to get into a flow here and I'm finding new things and interesting things. Um, and that that would continue to happen right the way through uh, the run. I mean, you know, for my entire time there you know we were constantly learning and developing new things and that really came out of i think the mentality that the directors tom morris and marion elliott instilled on the show which was this sense of creative freedom mm-hmm. within a framework so although you you knew that yeah the horse had certain things to achieve in this scene it had to hit certain marks at certain points um within that journey there was an, an enormous amount of creative freedom. Um, and, and that I think helped to keep it fresh. I mean, I, I, I you know, it was never boring, right. you know, it was boring being, being Joey the horse. I mean, sometimes it was painful. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And sometimes you would find yourself in a situation where if you'd picked up a, a slight niggle or an injury or something like that, mm-hmm. then there'd be times when the show would be more about pain management and less about, um, creatively finding the spirit of the horse and, and, and telling that, that story of, of, of Joey and his relationship to the boy Albert. Um, but by and large, you know, it was, it was an enormously creatively fulfilling experience and yeah, no, very, very, very grateful to have, to have been a part of that. And really, you know, I've got a lot to thank Warhorse for because it was Warhorse really, that was the sort of, the link if you like which which took derek and i into star wars yeah uh, i don't know if derek, i don't know if derek mentioned that to you when when he was when you had uh, when he was on your show he did yeah the, the war horse yeah. is like the catalyst for yes. everything but and, yeah and those skills translate as well it's it's amazing uh i do have to ask though having done both acting and creature performances be it, it's just, i mean it's obviously hard to compare but do you have a preference um, cause you're pretty good at both. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, uh, do you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to differentiate because I think it's interesting. There's a conversation that seems to be sort of, uh, you know, emerging at the moment. I saw a, a Twitter thread. Um, I think that Frank Oz was, had either put out or part of something that he was championing. Um, and, and Mark Hamill picked up on this and, you know, Frank Oz was talking about, uh, I think Muppeteers and, you know, the difference between saying, well, you know, the puppeteers aren't actors or, and I think Mark Hamill was kind of saying he'd had a similar experience with voiceover artists. Yes. Not being actors. actors are actors, man. Exactly. Actors are actors. And we, I think we find this a fair bit when it comes to creature performance too. Sure. Um, 
and also can you know the, the certainly the, the 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 more animal side of creature puppetry because you know with some of the star wars characters that we do they're 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 humanoid in their form if you like you know they have sure. a weird and wonderful alien head but the rest of them is 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 kind of humanoid um mm-hmm. whereas with with some of the more you know um direct kind of animal or creature puppetry that Derek and I find ourselves doing like yeah. we were involved in doing a, a polar bear for sky fortitude um uh or i mean i've done some um gorilla work for millennium fx yes, um i've seen the behind so, the scenes yeah um so but even with those more direct animal and creature sort of performances, it's, you know, I st- I'm, I'm still using the same skills and tools that I was taught as an actor Sure. to, to make sure that the, or, or I hope to sort of try and make the performance as believable, believable as I can. So, um, so yeah, I suppose a little bit like that initial thread that I was talking about, I think, um, I don't, I try not to differentiate the two, you know, that's, fine. Um, that's a better way to look it, at it. Definitely have their own you know they, they 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 definitely have their own challenges you know yeah, uh i can imagine you know and I, and I don't want to say that i don't necessarily want to say that one is easier or harder than the other but what i what i will say is that creature performance uh certainly in regards to animatronic heads right um, comes with its own set of challenges that makes you appreciate sometimes perhaps uh, you know <laughs> not having a head on you <laughs> not having those heads if, you know if you're standing on a stage and you're delivering you know your lines and and of course you know there's, there's, there's hard work involved in that you know you're absolutely you're having to you know act react work with your fellow actors to um to make sure that what you're doing is believable mm-hmm. um but what but what you don't have is those, <laughs> those added set of of challenges, which is often with these animatronic heads. You know your your visib- you know your visibility is very limited. Um, Audio wise, you're all, you're all, sometimes you're struggling to hear because of the sounds of the animatronic motors inside the head, mm-hmm. and um, and sometimes as well you're you're you, you have to deal with a lack of oxygen as well. So you're, yeah. <laughs> you're you you know you've got three sort of added kind of challenges on top of 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 just getting from a to b and and delivering the lines <laughs> oh yeah when multiple senses are not in effect yeah, yeah. <laughs> can't hear you can't see <laughs> but but go so yes speaking yeah, yeah. of that we're gonna we're gonna get into star wars okay let's do it let's yeah. do it we have to do it at some point <laughs> this is, exactly exactly this i always tell people i was like this show it's not a star wars podcast but it's a common thread because it's usually yeah. how I come to know people, and it's it's a I mean it's, it's the best thing ever. So people connect over this franchise. Um, yeah, brilliant. Cool. So we're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna go from the beginning. How did you get involved in Star Wars? Okay, so I was very lucky. Um, I mentioned we were talking earlier on about the Walking with Dinosaurs tour. Yes. And I got back to London. Um, that tour had finished. Um, and the rumor mill in my sort of close circle of uh, puppeteers, it was, a- it was absolutely on fire. You know, uh, mm-hmm. Star Wars, the new Star Wars was, was, was going to be shot in, in London at Pinewood Studios and there was going to be puppetry involved and suit work and creature work and all this kind of stuff. And so people were getting very excited about it. Um, and I begun to hear about all of this mm-hmm. on the tail end of the Walking with Dinosaurs tour um, and so I, I, I kind of felt like I'd missed the boat when I got back and I was feeling a bit sort of down in the dumps about that. I was feeling a bit glum. Yeah. Um, and, and then it all turned around because Derek Arnold had, had, uh, got involved mm-hmm. in the initial kind of research and development sort of phases. Um, and, a, and another friend and colleague of mine, Liam Cook, um, was also involved. He was involved in doing um, uh, research and development for the Happabore. Oh, sweet! Well, or the creature that became the Happabore in the end. Yeah, uh, um, the big beast. The big beast, absolutely the big beast. Yeah, that's the one. And it just so happened the uh, the creature coordinator Brian Herring. Um, yes. He asked, yeah, Brian. Brian asked sort of Liam, and he asked uh, Derek for a list of names, and very luckily my name was on both lists. Hey, there you go. 
So Brian went, okay, this guy's on both lists, right? Let's 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 give this guy a call. And the next thing I knew, I was there with Derek, you know, in in the front of uh, a, a skeletal sort of a very early version of what went on to become uh, the Lugger Beast, or we, mm-hmm. we you know we call it the Small Beast or Little Beast. Yes. Um, and there we were at Q Stage at Pinewood Studios. Um, trying to trying to make this thing move and trying to give it some life and 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 see see what its physical limitations were and see if we could see if we could put Kieran Shah on the back of it and still <laughs> and still you know run around the soundstage um, and yeah and that's that's kind of that's where it all began for me and it didn't really you know it's one of those things where it didn't you know until we were out there in Abu Dhabi it still didn't feel real. Sure. It still had that sense of like, am I really, am I really involved in Star Wars? Yeah. Like, <laughs> sure. Any moment it felt like, you know, you know, maybe it would it would go in a different direction, or the or the you know they might decide that, you know, okay, no, we, we this is not working, or 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 perhaps you know, J J Abrams might you know have a lineup of things and go, yeah, this one, this one, but not that one, you know? So it really, until, until we were out there, you know, stand, standing there on that, on that extraordinary set, um, it didn't really feel real. And then of course it, it felt like a childhood dream come true. <laughs> then it's very real. <laughs> <laughs> very, very real and terrifying as well. <laughs> oh my God. So the, so the Lugger Beast was your first character? That was the first. Yeah, that was the first thing that we did for the Force Awakens. Man, that's yeah. nuts. I see. I gotta figure out a way to get Brian Herring on here because he's a common thread in these shows. Yeah, yeah. It was it was Brian really that that brought. Uh, I mean, he was the yes, exactly. He was the kind of the key. Really, he he drew a lot of us in and and, and onto that project. Um, uh, and you, I, I believe. I think I've read this. I think Neil Scanlon. Uh, was interviewed, and I think I read that he said that J.J. Abrams had seen the Warhorse yes. show and had said to Neil, I want something that looks like, or something that, that was operated in a similar kind of way. Because, mm-hmm. um, of course, you know, the Warhorse and the Lugger Beast look very different, but but right. internally, they, they, there's, they, there are similarities. Um, like Tom and Derek. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, so, so there was a, so I think for Brian as well, there was a sense of like, uh, you know, reaching out to different areas of, of, of performance and, and skill sets and puppeteers and perhaps ones that he hadn't traditionally worked with before. And so, you know, yeah, he was having to kind of reach out to, to different people to say, okay, do you know someone that might, might be suitable for this type of work? Um, sure. That's a yeah, but, you know, hey, great. <laughs> Great to get Brian on. I'm sure Brian's got some. I'm sure he's got some great stories that he could tell you about. You know, those those, those initial sort of uh, those kind of early early times. Yeah. Sure. See, that's a good friend. He he got the door open for Star Wars and was like, "Come on in, guys. Well done." <laughs> yeah. Well done. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no, no. We all we all owe an awful lot to Brian in that sense for sure. So I heard you uh you you physically trained a little bit for uh for some lug beast action in the desert. Yeah, how the I re- how'd that go and how'd that pan out? <laughs> well, I really I I so this so <laughs> it got it got sort of uh, what often happens with with suits um, is that they they get heavier and heavier and heavier and we expect that we understand that that's part of the job you know sure. you kind of go okay as the build goes along you you start off with this nice kind of light skeletal sort of uh framework which you know derek and i were ju- we were throwing this thing around q stage you know it was like a panther in fact that was what in fact that was the kind of the movement quality that we discussed uh interestingly enough when you look at when you look at the the, the final look of the lug of beast and you look at this huge kind of heavy sort of part robotic kind of creature that was kind of you know, stomping around more like a kind of rhino type thing. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that where we where we began was 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 something that was more akin to a big cat. It had a kind of panther esque kind oh. of quality. We were really sort of like throwing this thing around Q stage and and sort of getting it to move in some really interesting ways. But obviously, as the weight began to increase, as the design became uh, you know more settled. 
um, we, we were finding this thing was getting heavier and heavier. And I was, <laughs> I was getting, I was getting more and more concerned. I was like, wow, I need to, I need to get down the gym. I really need to make sure <laughs> I have the job of doing this because, you know, we're not just talking about, you know, having this thing on location in England. We're talking about operating this thing in the extreme heats of the desert. So, yes. so, so I, so I was going to the gym and I was stacking the weight bar. I was doing squats and deadlifts and then I was going to uh around the corner from where, where I lived at the time there was a sauna and I was going and I was uh going to this really hot sauna and I was doing kind of yoga exercises in there to like to like <laughs> building up like, building up all that yeah. confidence <laughs> yeah exactly like yeah okay this is gonna be great you know I'm gonna be really uh, you know and it was reminding me of my time on walking dinosaurs as well I was like you know okay I got this I, you know, I, 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 I know specifically what muscle groups I need to train. I need to, you know, I was like, I was like, okay, great. You know? Yeah. And then you get up there. <laughs> you get into Did you realize the sauna is not a desert? <laughs> it, it, you, it, it literally, I, I felt as weak as a kitten. I, I was like, it was extraordinary. I was like, I, 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 I I'm not sure I can do this. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, the, that heat just, saps your energy i mean it, it it just it yeah it was it was extraordinary but we were very fortunate actually because um uh jj wanted to film during the uh during the golden hour so oh, right we're filming at dusk. yeah at sunset we were filming at sunset for a, and we had i think i think yeah we had maybe like 45 minutes to an hour and wow. and so we shot this set the sequences with the like a beast over I think it was three possibly four consecutive evenings and by by that point the the temperature had dropped sufficiently that actually we felt like yeah the, it, you know, we could do it <laughs> wow <laughs> that is nuts so uh how how's walking in sand carrying that kind of weight it's it's a whole it's a whole other it's a whole other level um <laughs> has to be <laughs> yeah i mean it's and also you're, you're factoring in you're not only you're talking about walking in sand but you're also talking about walking downhill um oh, yeah you know, so if you you know if you've ever if you've ever walked i don't know even if you've been to the beach and you're walking over the dunes or something you know if you walk down sand as soon as you step into it if it's if it's loose sand you know, your foot just slides away from you and the sand goes out from underneath you and, oh, and you it gives create away this, immediately. It gives way, absolutely. You create these pockets in the in, in, in the sand. So then if you imagine you've got the the weight of the lugger beast and then you've also got Kieran Shah right. sitting <laughs> on top of it as well. Um and you're also trying to sort of you you know, you've got you, you a good portion of your brain is thinking about the performance that you're doing as well. You know, um, you take into all those factors and suddenly, you know, there we were and it was like action and we were walking down a sand dune and, and there was one moment I remember so clearly that I thought, yeah, we're going over. We're, <laughs> this, this is it. We went, yeah, this is it. We're going. And, and afterwards it was interesting. So I spoke to Kieran afterwards and Kieran said that he, or he, he clocked that moment too. He had a moment where he went, Oh yeah, we're, we're going over. And he actually prepped himself to do a stunt roll. Oh, so perfect. as, so if it did fall, if it did fall, he was going to stunt roll off the, off the top. And so, so he would be okay. Um, somehow, I don't know how we did it. Somehow, we, we, we fought against that momentum that was taking us over. We managed to keep it upright and, and, and continue. Um, sure. But yeah, I, I know I, how you I did just, it. I just remember having my heart in my mouth and thinking, Oh my goodness, this is the, like, this is the first take and, and we're going <laughs> we're we're to fall over in this thing. <laughs> you made it to star Wars and you're going to eat it. You're just having flashbacks of yeah. you and that dinosaur. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> this will be it. This is, you know, the sum total of my star Wars career, yeah. you know, we've been out there. We fell over, and I was never invited back again. You know, <laughs> that's right. there'll be one person that's like, "Wasn't that the guy that fell over in Walking with Dinosaurs?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's made a career out of falling over. <laughs> yeah, just, I mean, he's if you're good at something, you know. <laughs> yeah, stick with it. Stick with it. You know? That is gold. It's a niche. It's a niche. He, yeah, they uh, and Derek told the story about how Neil Scanlon was just like yelling at you guys, like, "I want my seven seconds." And Brilliant. Then, and then uh, you guys singing yeah. Flow Rider. Oh my goodness. You Go know, Derek, Derek was uh 
whenever I hear that song, it yeah. instantly <laughs> it instantly transports me back to that moment. Like that, like literally, I'm right there, clipped into the Lugger Beast with Derek behind me singing that song, and it was. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's become the kind of the thing that, you know, like if, if we're in a challenging situation physically, um, you know, he'll look at me and I think he'll sort of go, OK, where's Tom at right now? How, how's he doing? Is he does he need a little bit of encouragement? And then if he starts to <laughs> sing that song then I know, OK, this is it. I've got to I've got to bring my A game. And this right. is, we're, we're back at that place where, you know, and <laughs> I need that kind of encouragement. Um, but yeah, I pick, pick up on what Derek said about Neil as well. Uh, just I, I love working for Neil Scanlon. He is such an inspirational figure, both Absolutely. In, the, in the in the sort of the early stages when you're in the workshop or when you're in the sort of the, the research and development phase or when you're, you know, when you're right there in the thick of it on set. Neil is, is, is always such a positive force. He's there, he's encouraging, um, and, and as Derek was saying, in that moment, you know, he was, he, was, he was absolutely there, kind of, you know, sort of shouting encouragement from the sidelines. I mean, at one point, I think he even rushed in. We had a, the, uh, for one of the takes, uh, we had a slight uh, malfunction on one of the straps, I think, on the head. And so it, it tipped slightly to the side and it wasn't sitting quite right. I think Neil rushed in. And I think he was ready to actually be there during the next take to kind of hold the head in place and sort of walk with us uh, down the track that we were on. So, yeah, he's um, yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a great guy to work for. He's a big hero of mine. I'm a big fan of Aliens. And uh, yes. this guy kills it. Kills yeah. it. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. So what other characters did you play in episode seven? So in episode seven, Mm -hmm. um, the main, I think probably the main other thing that, that I did was the droid, the yellow droid. B40. Yeah. B40. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I got so, you know, I've got such a soft spot for Buford, you know, like, like he gave, like he didn't he bit of a mixed reception for him i think you know <laughs> some, of the fa- some of the fans were like oh what yeah, is that what is going Why, on with that what, box <laughs> yeah what is literally what is going on with that box you know like what um but 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 i actually i got a lot of love for buford and i and sort of yeah i i and i was i was really i was so excited and pleased when he um when i got to jump inside again for um for the last jedi as well because yeah see him you see you know briefly you see him sort of uh welding i don't know welding something to a starfighter or something in um in the last jedi and i was i was super pleased to to, to kind of uh reacquaint myself with with that relationship because uh yeah i like i i just like buford i like his movement quality you know he's kind of big and he's slow but actually when you're inside him you know there's there's an awful lot there's an awful lot you can get out of him he's got these wonderful kind of rotating kind of um, wrists and and sort of uh, uh, sprung release kind of um, clamps on the end of his kind of mm-hmm. wrists and uh, and there's this great kind of uh, concertina sort of uh, tubing that runs up that your arms go inside so you can and and again that there's there's a concertina section between the torso and the bottom part as well so so there's an awful lot of movement that you can get out of him and I and I I I, I you know I hope that you know when i'm in there I, I try and make him as expressive as i can um sure how do, you, I offer... how do you see so actually buford uh there's a lot of there's it's good visibility in buford because what you've got is um cut into the shell are these little kind of panels and strips which have been covered with mesh mm-hmm. um and they, they they sort of perforate um the uh so the left hand side and and i think a but on the right and also at the front as well. So you actually, you, you've got quite a lot of visibility inside there. You, you can see out quite a bit, which I have to say was great because um, kind of my all time or not my all time, but my probably the, the, the first moment that I, that it really landed for me that I was in star Wars. And I had this little moment of going, Oh my goodness was when I was, uh, when we positioned Buford underneath the millennium Falcon oh, level base on dude. Buford. Uh, so in Greenham Common, yeah, and you know, I mean, number one, the fact that you know my character was getting to do stuff to to the Millennium Falcon, just to be that close to the Falcon yeah. itself was 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 extraordinary. But then, you know, 
when we actually went for the take, I kind of looked out and suddenly realised that it was it was a, it was a scene being shot with with Harrison Ford. So, oh. so, so, you know, like standing, you know, sort of almost close enough to touch was Harrison Ford dressed as Han Solo. And it was and I, you know, I just had this kind of moment of going, oh, my goodness, here I am. I'm underneath the Millennium Falcon. Han Solo's right there. It was yeah, it was a total boyhood dream come true. Oh my god, I can't imagine. Good thing you were in a shell where they couldn't see you crying. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. Man, I, that's stuff dreams are made of, man. Yeah, really. So it was, you, yeah, it was, it was quite extraordinary. So you were you're a big Star Wars fan. I mean, how could you not be? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. As a kid, I mean, it was oh, yeah, I had all the action figures and uh uh, I'm, you know, over here in this country, I'm part of that generation who, uh, of, of, of kids who, who still haven't forgiven their parents yeah. for <laughs> throwing send, them out or their, yeah, just sending all their toys to like a car boot sale or something like that. You know, I used to have, the, I used to have the sort of the Millennium Falcon and, uh, oh wow. Yeah. Like all, all the toys. We love them. My brother and I absolutely, you know, yeah, we loved the films when we were kids. We used to do these things called, um, uh, movie marathons. So, so I think I think I'm sure my mum was over the moon because it would it would you know occupy us for hours and hours at a time. Yeah. So she <laughs> plonk us down in front of the in front of the VHS and we would we would watch the the three films back to back and and yeah sort of many many hours spent sort of watching Star Wars films as a kid. So yeah 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 sure. it was a big big part of my childhood. Well, she may have thrown out your figures, but you have a picture of you in front of the actual Millennium Falcon in front of yeah. actual Han Solo. Yeah, exactly. Dude. So, yeah. See, mum. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ha-ha. <laughs> yeah, ha. Who's winning now, you know? That's right. <laughs> so, as a, as a Star Wars fan, when you work on Rogue One, you got to be Ponda Baba. Yeah, now that really came out of the blue, that, and that was a real, real sort of surprise to me. Um, uh, and I, again, I couldn't, I couldn't quite believe it to begin with. Sure. Because um, I was kind of going... Because I, I think I saw, I'm trying to remember what, which way around it was. I think initially, I, I think I knew that I was going to be playing um, uh, uh, that particular species of alien. Right. But I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I knew to begin with that it was actually going to be Ponda Baba. And I think obviously then when I realized it was, there was this, again, this moment of like, oh my goodness, like, <laughs> you know. Not only is not only is this really awesome that I'm going to get to play this character, but also really cool that this character is being brought back as well. For sure, because um, because it was one of those things that I think Gareth Edwards, uh, you know, and there were a few of them in Rogue One. Um, yes, you know, they're, they're appealing to the fandom and sort of saying little little a little nod and a wink to to, to what's come before and. Um, or I suppose in the chronology of, uh, of of Rogue One, actually, what comes after. Right. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, and 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 so yeah, it was great, and and getting to sort of uh, meet and work with Michael Smiley as well, who played Doctor of Azam, was yes. was was exciting. Um, and on the day, on the day, it was uh, it was yeah, it was it was it was it was kind of a, a, a crazy sort of busy environment that we were having to do this in. Right, right. Uh, kept um they kept wanting they, they kept populating it more and more uh with with supporting artists who were playing the kind of the, the villagers um mm-hmm. uh and uh they kept going oh yes yeah, it's, it's not you know we, yeah we need more people we need more people we need more people and it was getting busier and busier and busier and again you know when you've when you're dealing with that as a challenge with the animatronic head and your kind of visibility is not brilliant and you're kind of going oh my goodness like how am i gonna navigate this terrain because there are just so many people right um but on the day gareth had this you know great style of sort of free form where there was a lot of improvisation we we you know we we, we did, did you know we did a number of takes and um and inside that you know i think there was a, a yeah there was a lot of improvisation and being able to kind of play it in different ways and yeah it was um it was a fun day that one and 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 again very exciting to sort of to bring uh, that particular character to life, because I know that he, I know that he sits, in, you know, within the Star Wars fandom, he he has a certain amount of notoriety, and um, yeah, I felt very privileged to be able to sort of, um, yeah, bring him to life in uh, in Rogue One. Sure, every time I watched it, I, I I'm not gonna lie to you, I saw Rogue One a lot. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> they had uh, Regal Cinemas here, 
had this like ultimate ticket that they sold. And it yeah. was like you pay a hundred bucks up front and you can watch it once a day, every day for as long as it's in theaters. Like including wow. IMAX. I was like, Well, done. <laughs> and, uh, I saw I'm it, gonna get most out of this ticket. Oh dude, I saw it twenty three times. Wow. I, it's like I have a free hour and a half. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna go watch Star Wars because it doesn't cost me anything. Wow. And That's every sing yeah, dude, every single time when Panda Baba showed up, it was like, Oh, oh I know this guy. It was great. <laughs> great, great moment. That's great. Oh, I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased. Every single time. But you, so you were also one of a, a bunch of puppeteers that did Borgullet. Yeah. What part that's of right. Borgullet were you? So I was sort of stuffed up inside the head section. Oh, you were of... in Borgullet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was. So I think I think stuffed up inside the head was my it was myself. Phil Woodfine and Lynn Robertson Bruce. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, yeah, I was, I was right. Yeah. I was right up inside the kind of, or almost like the back of Bor Gullet's head. I was making, there were these kind of panels on the, on the sort of upper back side of his head, which, um, almost gave the impression that he was breathing. Okay. I saw like the in and outs uh, of his temple sort of thing. <laughs> That's exactly it. That's exactly it. So, so those were the sort of two panels that I was operating. Um, uh, yeah, and I was, I think I was highest up inside this. So I remember getting pretty hot because <laughs> I was getting. Well, I mean, because oh, there were loads of us. I can't remember exactly how many there was. I think mean, there might have been as many as twelve puppeteers on board, Gullet. But there was there was a lot of heat coming up inside there. <laughs> he rises, man. Yeah. And Derek was yeah. telling me about that giant tank in the back. Oh yeah, that was amazing. That's that was crazy that was extraordinary and i'm where i saw so where i had to climb up i had to climb up and i had to kind of have there was a little ledge that i was that, that, that was just big enough for me to put one of my feet onto so i so i could put one foot there but then i had to have my other foot resting against the side of the tank now you never saw this it was inside but but right. it was on the access panels for where I think they were, they would essentially fill the water. Um, and there, I remember distinctly one of the, um, the engineers, Pete Hawkins saying, whatever you do, like don't stand on that particular valve, because if you knock that <laughs> valve off, however many, I don't know how much water is in there. There was an awful lot of water in there, but like, like, you know, gallons and gallons of water is just literally going to pour out, out down onto the bottom of the soundstage. Oh, no. So, so I was kind of having to kind of precariously balance my foot on, you know, rivets around the outside of this kind of pa perspex panel, sort of in the hope that, 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 you know, that I could kind of stay balanced and, yeah. and, and, you know, not fall down, but also not knock this valve and, and, you know, create a disaster right. uh, <laughs> they had to talk to you be like we know you've fallen before tom Don't yeah do it here. <laughs> you know you're the guy that falls yeah, exactly. this is not the time this is not the time for this exactly. yeah that's all that that's way it. not onto exactly. this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's awesome so yeah. what, what uh what other characters did you play in rogue one or were those like your main so, ones uh let's look let's think so pond baba we, um borg gullet and uh, yeah, I think that might have been it for Rogue. That's really big. I think that might have been it for Rogue, yeah. How big was that... Borgullet? Uh, like, say again? How big was Borgullet? If you've got like oh, 12 massive. people puppeting. Yeah, he, like, absolutely, yeah, huge. It was huge. Um, yeah. Uh, like, I mean, I don't know, like, you could fit maybe three of us up in you know kind of the on the inside of the head but wow that yeah no it was and of course it was all raised up so so you had the the, the majority of the puppeteers were kind of substage operating from down there and then and then of course there were, there were more puppeteers at the top right um you know with from, you know from the rc element there i think there was some movement on the eyes and um and other bits and pieces as well and there were also of course the tentacles uh, uh, that, that, were, that were being puppeteered up top as well so yeah yeah it was, it was, it, but yeah, but it was a massive, it was a massive thing. That's what's great as well, because you see when, you know, when, when Neil Scanlon is sort of, when he gets to make something like that, you know, um, he goes all out yeah. and, and you, and you, and you get this fully realized sort of photo real kind of puppet that is just extraordinary to look at. 
you know right. and scale and obviously scale has that kind of wow factor too you absolutely know, you just look at it and go i mean yeah yeah ball gullet was 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 yeah was an impressive an impressive looking beast it's a really cool looking alien and uh, yeah so i i do have a question though because i've always wondered i know the tentacles like some of them were puppeted by people the ones that actually like go up riz ahmed as Bodhi, was that CGI? Was that somebody actually like touching him? Well, I don't know for sure. Mm-hmm. I can't. I can't give a definite answer on that. My, uh, what I would imagine is that, that, that would have been that probably would have been the magicians at ILM that would have taken over at that point. That um, makes sense. To 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 do that, um, I mean, there's a possibility that they, that perhaps on the day uh, the puppeteers on set might have provided some kind of movement reference for that. So they might have done some tentacle stuff with Riz and then, um, and then in post-production, you know, the, the guys at Ireland would have taken over. Um, sure. That's an amazing yeah, that's, symbol. Thing, of course, I, you know, what you got to remember is that sort of uh, oftentimes as a puppeteer, you're in a situation where when you're inside something, oh, yeah. you, you know, you, 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 what you, you're, what you're getting is you're getting camera feed. Um, but you, but there's a lot of other elements that you don't really know what goes on. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> you know. Like um, very limited vision. Yeah. Fair, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair. So that's a beautiful uh, symbiotic relationship that you, the creature performers, have with ILM to create yeah. what we see. Like the fact that I'm sure you and Derek had to have your legs painted out of the Lugga Beast. Absolutely. Amazing. I mean, you wouldn't yeah. know. Totally, yeah. totally. I think no, and I, I, I really do. I think that's um. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic aspect to, to to what we do. And I know that, you know, I know that there is or there are sort of ongoing machinations, you know, between, you know, visual effects and the practical world and mm-hmm. people that, you know, support practical world, you know, are oh, championing this and visual effects championing the other side. But I but I firmly and unashamedly you know support both aspects because there are things which which you know there are things that we can't do from a practical standpoint puppetry wise on set they're just you know there are there are always going to be limitations Mm -hmm. and likewise there are things that we can do practically which i think can have you know um the most compelling effect when it comes to the final um the the, you know the, the, the thing that we finally see um but that marriage between you know, the practical and then where the guys in post-production can take over and, and how they can augment and, and enhance and, uh, and, you know, finish things in, in a way that, that, that we perhaps can't do in the moment. I mean, it, then you get these really satisfying things like, you know, like you say, like, like the Lugger Beast, you know? Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sort of, I'm a real champion for both really. And certainly, certainly sort of the last few productions that I've worked on, uh, I was mentioning earlier, you know, the team that I work with, with Robin Guyver, particularly for the, for the Fantastic Beasts films. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we are very much occupying that kind of territory where we are practically with there and we're providing, um, uh, reference puppetry and also performances that give the actors something real to bounce off of. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're also very aware of the fact that in the end, you know, what we are working with is going to be a computer generated image. So, so we have to be sympathetic to that and we have to be aware of, of, of how we can, you know, combine those two things to get the best, you know? Sure. Hey, and as a, as the fan, I'm winning throughout. (laughs) Yeah, and that's that's yeah, exactly. That's 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 the hope, isn't it? That's the sort of that's the aim and the dream. You guys are doing an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, episode 8. Yeah. Dude, wow. As a Star Wars fan, you got to work with Luke Skywalker. Ah. Uh, what? What? Has that I has, have, has that glow like rubbed off cuz I feel like it never will. I yeah, agreed. Agreed. <laughs> I, I it, it, episode eight was was such a just such a fantastic experience it was it was it was really it was a joy it was a joy from start to finish um and you know not all not all jobs are like that you know not all not all films that you work on you know you you can't always say that but but episode eight was was just fantastic um you know it was great because there were as i mentioned before you know i got to go back and and, and re-inhabit um, 
Buford again, which yes. was great. So it's like reconnecting with old friends. But then also, you know, Derek and I found ourselves, you know, growing as puppeteers and being being you know, trusted with more responsibility, learning new skill sets, being able mm-hmm. to kind of challenge ourselves in, in, in a way that we hadn't done before. Um, we were, we were very lucky. We got to essentially uh, for, 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 for this sort of um, <clears throat> actually in the end, a lot of it didn't actually make the final cut, but uh, the, the sort of the caretaker sequences um, were caretakers. on the island. Well, we, we yeah, sort of we we Derek and I got to kind of shadow a couple of much more experienced animatronic sort of uh, face operators, um, uh, learn from them, sort of grow, and then and then and then we were able to kind of uh, yeah, we did we did some sort of uh, faces for the caretakers on the island. Um, in, uh, yeah, so so that was you know again you, you, you growing and, and learning new skills and, and being able to do stuff like that is just it's yeah. And it was all that. And then and then, you know, all, all the other crazy stuff that went with it as well, like going out to Ireland and <laughs> So you did Derek, you did go to Ireland. We I went to Ireland and we and we got to sort of you know, go in go inside the, the sea cow for yeah, the for, you for, did. for the, <laughs> yeah, you did. Um, <laughs> somewhat, somewhat notorious now. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say of those new skills you guys learned, lactating was one of them. There you go. There you go. We have <laughs> You have Derek Arnold to thank for that. You know, this is, uh, Was that I, him? I, 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 yeah, yeah. I sort of, I, at that point I, I put my hands up and I say, that was all Derek. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's Luke Skywalker out there. If he milks me, it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> I honestly, Brian, we, we were convinced that that scene was going to end up on the cutting room floor. Oh really? We, we were, we were like, this is, this is crazy. Yeah. That, you know, Luke Skywalker yeah. <laughs> milking, milking a sea cow, you know. Oh my god! Okay, so like it's sitting on it's sitting on the beach there. How exactly do you guys like how how are you two in there? We got there, uh, you know, climb up. So Derek had to go in first because um, essentially it was inside. It was like two. Um, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to describe, but essentially you've got two seats that kind of run that are like they're inside on, you know, one one above the other. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, Derek's head would probably be level with the others of the sea cow. My head would probably be level um, perhaps with sort of the chest of the sea cow. Um, so Derek had to climb in first so he could get into position. Um I then got in afterwards. One of my responsibilities was looking after the compressed air that essentially would uh, allow uh, yeah absolutely to create the yeah, the, the snorts and also i think uh, that would that would pressurize the the milk to be able to be kind of um released from the udders as well um and and yeah and then and then obviously we get in and they they seal they seal us in there oh no <laughs> And we oh, and no. because they had to, they had to essentially they have to glue. I think you know, once once the head gets put in position, so that the, the so it looks seamless, the join, so you can't see the join. Right. They essentially have to glue that down. So so once we were in, that was it. We were we were in for the duration of the filming. So I think we were in the sea cow for something close to five hours in the end. That's a bond. <laughs> that's a bonding experience. <laughs> isn't it just? Isn't it just? Um, Good thing you were friends beforehand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. Um, funny enough, we're, we're not friends any longer. Yeah, know. you know that makes sense. That's uh, the real right, reason yeah. I had you on was to break that news. <laughs> Piss the dirt on Derek Arnold. Yes, yeah. exactly. Well, let me tell you, Brian. It all, it all. Yes, the, the, that, that beautiful friendship all came to an end that day. <laughs> night, In an over, over a glass of green milk. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I told him not to drink it, but he just wouldn't listen. That's right. Listen. Derek is just inside. He's like, he's going to drink this. And he's just pouring yeah. the milk into the thing. Yeah. That is yeah. gold. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty crazy. Um, wow. Yeah. One of those surreal moments where you kind of go, are we, yeah, are we, um, yeah, we're, we're inside a sea cow sort of like that's been bolted to a cliff in an island and, <laughs> Luke Skywalker is about to come and milk us. Like what, you know, what, what's going on again? That's, going... The, that's the real stuff dreams are made of. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I would. So I was in, uh, when I was in Ireland, it was like June of, 
I think last year, and you guys had like just wrapped episode eight, and I yeah. heard from the locals in Port McGee. They're like, just go over there to Dingle. They filmed episode eight there. I'm like, oh, sweet. And I yeah. went, and they're very uh, not specific about it. They're like, I think it was over here. We're not really sure. So I kind of like walked around town. I was like, does anyone know where they filmed this? And they're like, I don't know. It's over there. So I didn't get to go to the actual location. And I was bummed out. Oh, and, no. and then I learned Ireland has like, they have, it's divided by counties, you know, and there's counties that have towns within them with the same name. So they were uh, like, they're like, uh, they filmed part of episode eight in Donegal. I was like, oh, sweet. Okay, cool. So I went to Donegal, not realizing they meant Donegal County and the actual location was in Mollenhead. Uh, and I was like, if I'd known, it was so strange. But that that's well, so cool. And the fact that you, they've helicoptered the creature to Ireland, it's amazing. It, well, yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely, yeah. Uh, the, well, I'll tell you what, though. If you go back next year, though, you, you, you might have a very different experience. Um, because certainly when when we were there, you know, every single cafe, bar, restaurant, everyone there had some kind of claim on the force awakens you know like oh, of course. like you know, <laughs> so, you know mark hamill had stood on this particular flagstone in this particular pub or there was something in the window that said you know like that, like you know everyone had some kind of investment in in you know in the force awakens which i thought was really great right. um so I suspect if you, you know, if you go back, if you, you know, if you go back to, to that, that region this kind of summertime, you know, it, it will all be, it will all be sort of Last Jedi related, I imagine. Oh, absolutely. Daisy Ridley had a sandwich here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Did, did yeah. You, I, I have to ask, did you try the milk? Because Luke, Luke, did you try it? No. No. Of course, <laughs> I, no. I don't know if I would have. Either. We don't get, we don't get to drink the milk, yeah, Ryan. Of we don't get. To. <laughs> you just produce. <laughs> there's like a vetting process That's and right. you know <laughs> only jedis get to drink milk and unfortunately you know we're not quite there yet <laughs> that's fair that's fair start at the sea cow you're literally just used by the jedi <laughs> that was that's it we, we, we be, you know that's a claim to fame i can say i was used by mark hamill you that's know? right you know what good for you <laughs> he survived on that island because of you guys well done yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's your claim to fame. Be like, you want to know why he's still alive? You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. So you, speaking of uh, the Tom and Derek inside another creature, you guys were the, yeah. the stable master. Yes. You were Borgwell right. Tom Durr, which, yeah, congrats, Tom. Tom Durr. Yeah. I see what Pablo did there. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. I'd be meaning to. I'd be meaning to drop uh, a line to Pablo and just kind of sort of because you know I don't know for sure that he did, but but you know I think I think did. that's what he did. So <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, yeah. So I need to I need to drop him a line and say thanks for that because um, yeah, when I when I saw uh, I can't remember where I was when I first saw that. I think it was when I was out in New York and we were in a toy store. I was in a toy store with my son and I think we picked up the visual dictionary or something and I was flipping through and saw it there and saw the name and kind of went, hold on a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I'm half <laughs> of this. Hang on. <laughs> I think that's my name. Definitely. So, uh, yeah. So, so to have, you know, to have a, to have a kind of a, a character in star Wars sort of named after yeah. me. Yeah. No, that, that was again, one of those moments where you just kind of go, Oh, so yeah. So, I mean, you know, big, big thanks big thanks to pablo for that that's really you you're know. like that you're now even more cemented into star wars history which is pretty incredible <laughs> <laughs> i mean think about it as a kid that played with star say? wars toys oh uh, what can i say to that yeah Dude. hey listen I, I you know what i really need i really I, you know i need an action figure i don't think i've got an action figure yet for any, right. for any that you're i've right. done I, you know what it better be buford like <laughs> i would love to be buford i, I would love to be I, buford i love that like so in in most things with Hollywood, you'll get actors that do certain roles, and they're like, eh, you know, it's a job, it's whatever. I absolutely love when people take ownership of their characters, and your love for yeah. Buford makes me so happy. <laughs> it's so good. But so so there's you and Tom are both in this stable master. Were you the arms that beat the Fothiers or the kids? <laughs> so that is re- that's a really good question. Okay, so uh... I, I plan that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's a lose lose situation here. Yeah. I either cruelty to children or cruelty to animals. So, right. I, you know, right. it's, 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 it's one or the other. Um, so, I now let me think about this. I, I, I believe that I'm the top set of arms, I think. And essentially, okay. Derek, 
Derek was 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 operating the the lower the lower set of arms. So you've um, got the whip. So I've got the whip. Yeah. Okay, that's slightly yeah. better so I... than beating children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So how did again, how do two of you fit in there? Because you're walking around like a person. Yeah. So so uh, Derek is Derek was particularly fond of this one because um, I think at times he he might have felt slightly self conscious on set because <laughs> essentially I was wearing the full costume mm-hmm. and then Derek was in a green morph suit. Really. Uh, hugging hugging me from behind essentially yes. it's like a little koala so, bear uh, yeah exactly <laughs> so i basically had uh a, you know a chroma key green koala bear in the form of derek stuck to my back for the duration <laughs> of that shoot um so i think you know i think he felt a little bit self-conscious about that that's fair uh, that's fair but you know i said to him i said to him look you know we this is this is what we do derek and this is <laughs> we have to bring this guy you know we have to bring this guy to life here and if that means you just have to climb into that you know skin tight green morph suit and yes. hug me from behind well then that's what you've got to do man you know <laughs> says the guy who gets to be the <laughs> alien in the suit <laughs> <laughs> like Derek, you've got this okay it's gonna be fine you're like i'm, a, I'm in the green suit <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that is amazing again, it, was, it was again it was awesome having Derek there actually because um, the, the, the visit, the, the vision was, was relatively limited, um, with that character. So being, having Derek there meant that actually he, he could help to rotate us to certain positions if uh-huh. we need to one way or another, just to kind of make sure that we were kind of hitting the eye lines and things. Um, so yeah, it was, um, yeah, again, as is always the case with these things, uh, you know, full on joint, joint sort of team effort, that one. Sure, sure. Are you yeah. are you guys also working on set, like doing other things when you're not in a specific character? Uh, yeah, we can, we we can do. Yeah, we we, we do find ourselves um, sort of uh, you know fulfilling other roles at times as well. So yeah, we 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 can we can be there. Sort of um, as as I mentioned before, you know, we were doing a little bit of kind of um, RC work for for the caretakers on right. the last Jedi. So. Um, yeah, and, and and occasionally um, we'll find ourselves doing, uh, I suppose, what you might think of as more traditional puppetry um, mm-hmm. roles on Star Wars. I mean, kind of less less so on Star Wars. I think um, we right. tend to do, you know, the more traditional film puppetry stuff. Um, I say it's traditional film puppetry stuff. Yeah, of I mean, you know, Sea Cows is you know, common. If, if anything, if anything's traditional puppetry stuff, you know, but yeah. um, but we tend to do more of the puppetry stuff on other franchises but for star wars it tends to be mainly doing the kind of the the animatronic heads and the creature work but no but we do yeah we, we do find ourselves doing other stuff we were doing i think the last jedi we did um we had a couple of days on set doing uh the omni droid and the mouse droid on the oh sweet on snoke's um uh the supremacy his ship with hugs. That, one, that one yeah snoke's ship yeah yeah that's awesome dude so yeah so yeah i mean sort of we you know i mean hey listen we always say we we feel so grateful to be there that you know neil and his team they can chuck anything at us and we'll just will happily get involved because you know i mean it just means you find yourself in in another absolutely extraordinary set sort of seeing uh you know these fantastic you know, fantastic costumes and creations. And, you know, the, the the props, everything, the set building, everything is just so so fabulous that you you know, yeah, we're we're very happy to be involved in whatever capacity we can do to to help. Really, sure. And it's it's also super cool that like you and Derek specifically being in the Lugabees, you saw like the beginning of Ray's story, and now having worked on Episode Eight, like that full circle is pretty beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're. We're sort of, I think we're hoping, uh, you know, not, I mean, nothing's so definite, but we're, we're hoping that for episode nine, we'll be invited back. And we're hoping that Neil uh, might have another sort of two person creature for us. And I think that for both of us would, would, would feel like a, like the circles being closed, you know, like a really sort of, in terms of our journey on the trilogy and, and, you know, having been there at the beginning i mean we we, we'd both love to be there at the end and if we could do another two-person creature on uh on episode nine then yeah that would that would really i think that would that would sort of um put the button up for us i think sure i'll send him a letter 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you mind, Brian? Just uh, yeah. <laughs> just drop, you know, drop, drop Neil Scanner. Maybe, maybe also JJ if you've got his. Yeah, uh, I mean, if I've got time, I just I mean, sort of jump on there. We, we had lunch no, today, no, those two guys. You know, those two guys inside the Lugger Beast. Do you, you remember, remember those two yeah, guys? Yeah, of course. No, okay. Well, they're my bud. They're my buds. All right. And yeah. If you could just hook yeah. them up, like give them a little something, something, like yeah. that'd be that'd yeah. be great. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll hook you guys up. Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, we, appreciate, we appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> so so all, all this came through. And then you have, I mean, this is, just, this is just amazing. But then you have one of my favorite YouTube series, The Drive-In. Hey. Yes. I, I love The Drive-In. Whose idea was it? Uh, I, I mean, obviously, Brian, I'm going to say it was my idea. Of course. Uh, I, um, I would expect you know. nothing less. I mean, Derek, you know, as, as you will have seen on the drive in, you know, Derek is a, is a man of many words, but, but, but <laughs> very little intelligence. So, <laughs> so, so, so obviously, you know, any of the, any of the good ideas that you see in there obviously come from me. Of course. Uh, of course. Um, <laughs> Where else would they come? I no, mean, you're the you know, front I legs, you know, you know, I, I, you know well, exactly. Of course it's going to be <laughs> No, I, you know, I can't actually remember how, how in the end it kind of came about. I think because the, the silly thing is the way that even before we even even before we started filming and, and doing and, you know, actually trying to make something of it in, in regards to the YouTube channel, mm-hmm. we were still doing that. So, oh, so it, was just, it was just two guys in a car at 530 in the morning on the way to, you know, on the way to sort of uh Pinewood Studios or wherever we were going, just talking nonsense for an hour. Um, <laughs> and and at Patrick some point, Stewart some impressions. Point we like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and at some point we were like, we, we maybe we should maybe we should film this. Like maybe we should sort of you know. I think once we'd done it once and we kind of watched it back, you know, kind of peering at it through through our hands, kind of hoping that it wasn't terrible. And then we kind of went, okay, you know what? Maybe maybe this is okay. Maybe we can do something with this. Um, but I just I think it's just so stupid that to begin with, it was just <laughs> there, there were no cameras, there was no audience. It was just the two of us, just just kind of you know, with with way too much energy for five thirty in the morning. You know, I don't know, I don't know where where it where it comes from, but um, uh, probably because you're going to Pinewood. <laughs> well, there is that. There is that. I mean, it's, just a tiny yeah. little thing. It's like yeah. Anyway, I, yeah. I think if you're headed to Pinewood at five thirty in the morning, you're in a little bit of a happier brain space. Well, do you know what? Do you know what I've always said about working on the Star Wars franchise that it's the only, it's, it's probably the only job in the world that I can imagine getting up when my alarm goes off at five in the morning. That I, that that I don't, you know, I don't roll over and moan and go, oh no, you know, like literally, I'm leaping out of bed, like I'm like, yeah, let's 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 have at this day. That's you know right. what? What is you know what does it hold today? What you know what what strange new sort of crazy things that we're going to have to do today. So, yeah, you're right. That's Same. probably why we we're, <laughs> so, we're so sort of psyched for, yeah, for it. So a little behind the scenes on that show. In the episodes that we've released, which, by the way, it's been too long. So uh, if, you can, know. if you can roll out we that next to. one. <laughs> yep, you're right. You're right. We need to, yeah. Yeah. So, so do you know, what, see what happened actually? We we had another one in the can. And it was ready to go. It was our it was our our Warhorse Bradford special. We went up to um what? to a, to a town in the north of England called Bradford where uh, they were promoting the uh the the tour, the UK Warhorse tour. And so Derek and I were asked to go and do some promotional puppetry for that. Um and yeah, so we had that one. And it was ready to go. And then my Mac, the screen on my Mac broke and um, to try and to try and fix it. The guys, that, you know, they were, they were fantastic, the guys at Genius Bar, but they did, they suggested doing a whole reset thing. And, and in doing that, it, it kind of wiped the, the sort of the, uh, my, uh, yeah, my editing software on, on. So, so we lost that episode. So yeah, that's, that's why we're a little bit behind. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you're right. The next one, it's coming soon. It's, we're, yeah, we're going to get that out there. That's a fair excuse. I'll, I'll accept it. I'll, <laughs> yeah. accept it. I'll accept it for now. For now. For now. Yeah, you, you've, you've earned yourself some time, Mr. Wilton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a little behind the scenes on that. What movie were you filming while recording the episodes that were out? Oh, okay, that's a that's a good that's a really good question. So um so they yeah, this tracks back to I I you know, I think we're talking about The Last Jedi. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I think we're talking about The Last Jedi. Dude, um and there's no way we'd know. Mm-mm. No. That's no, so, that's so cool. When you're like, oh, you know these guys. Oh, by the way, they were going to film Star Wars. 
<laughs> well done with the nonchalance, gents. Well done. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that the first batch of stuff that we released for the drive-in was was yeah that we we did during our time on on the Last Jedi. Um, there's definitely got quite a backlog of stuff actually. Um, there's de- we, you, there will be definitely some some stuff that we need to release um, from future projects. I was about to say, it, and yeah, then I really can't, I probably can't <laughs> say. It. You know, so you may um, or may not be busy or something. Whatever yeah, we can. Move on to future <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I would, yeah, I would say at a guess, I would say, you know, the stuff that you can see, uh, on the drive-in is pr- yeah, it's probably, um, from around the, the last Jedi time. Yeah. That is awesome. Now, uh, it, I, I have to ask, I know they're all like your children, but do you have a <laughs> favorite character that you've played so far? And is it Buford? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. It's, um, it's a hard one. It's a hard one. I... Yeah, oh, I, I should really, I should really say one with Derek, shouldn't I? You know, I'd be like, ah, oh, yeah, the ones that I do with Derek. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, you, know, you know, you know, weirdly, you know, he doesn't have much screen time, and like I said, he's definitely not a fan favorite. But yeah, I, you know, for me, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say Buford. Yeah. Yes, that is that is amazing. And, <laughs> and then I have to ask because this is a question that uh, I, I ask everybody: Do you have a favorite Star Wars character? Because that's a, that's a real oh. hard one, but it says a lot about someone who they pick. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. So this is this is tread carefully, territory, yeah. isn't it? This is really carefully. That's right. The volume um, has been turned up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, here we go. Here it is. Um, so I, um, oh, so uh, as a kid, mm-hmm. you know, flat out, you know, I absolutely idolized Harrison Ford. So you know, for me growing up. You know, it was Han Solo and Indiana Jones all the way. Like, Gotta be. you know, so <clears throat> and what's, and what I find is quite interesting is that my for my son, that same level of kind of hero worship um, has, it, it, you know, is transferred on to Poe Dameron. Oh, um, right on. So, so I think it's very interesting. Interesting that, that, you know, I think, I mean, I'm sure it's probably a, a conscious thing in trying to, you know, what JJ was doing in terms of trying to revamp it and then, you know, where Ryan has developed the Poe Dameron character. Um, so, yeah, for, for, for him, it's Poe. For me as a kid, it was definitely Han. Um, but now, you know, there's oh, there's just so much, isn't there? There really is. I, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go slightly, I'm, I'm going to be quite specific. I'm, I'm going to say, I I really really enjoyed the direction that they developed um, Carrie Fisher's character in the Last Jedi. Oh yes, you know Gen- you know Le- Gen- General Aragorn. You know I just I I just I, I I loved I loved the direction that it went. So I think Same. you know for the Last Jedi for where we are right now here in 2018 for Star Wars, it's it's Leia it's Leia for me. That's, I think that is a perfect answer. Cause that that was <laughs> amazing. I'm one of those people that went in like I liked seven, but eight was like, oh my god, this movie's incredible. Yeah. And that moment when you just see her hand move, you're like, oh, is this happening? Is this happening? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gold. I t- I, to- I totally agree. And yeah, and I just I just think I think it was the, it, you know, it was the right it's the right time and it's the it's the, it, it you know to make the film that Ryan made. I think it was. It was bold, um, you know. Very. He, he, he took a he took a risk. He went with his heart. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we all know that there has been that it hasn't sort of in some camps it's not had the most sort of favorable response. Um, and I think that's a shame because I, I really think that 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 what Ryan has done is moved Star Wars forward. Uh, and I'm sure that we have to also, you know, thank Kathleen Kennedy for this too. Absolutely. You know, moved Star Wars forwards in a direction um, which I think is really exciting, uh, really interesting, and, and I think really sort of right for where we are here in this world in 2018, you know? I agree. Absolutely agreed. It was like, it, it just, it felt very George Lucas. Crazy, yeah. off the walls, like took risks, and we're like, this is Star Wars. Star Wars is weird sometimes. This is a cow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I loved it. Absolutely, and, used, and you, you know, you sort of conventions that I don't think we've seen before in Star Wars, like like that fantastic sort of. Uh, oh, so what, what, can we can we talk? Can we talk? I mean, is it too early to talk? Are we talking spoilers now? Oh, we, we, are, we, we are going in, my friend. 
we're going in. Okay, do you know what? We're going to just, just do it. Let's do it. Yeah. So one of the sequences that I loved most was the um, was the was the the question mark over uh, Luke's character in the flashback sequences. Yes. I just loved that, and it for me that again that was very you know I mentioned when we were talking at the beginning of our chat about Kurosawa and and for me that had a, a distinctly Rashomon esque quality to it. This sure. idea of looking back. At, at, at and how we remember the past and how we remember certain things and and and, and where is that line between truth uh, you know you know what's true what's false and that blurred line in between and i and i thought those sequences were just i, I thought they were beautifully realized i absolutely loved it for sure totally agreed mm. but mm. dude this has been a great time this hey really fun. yeah i've kept yeah, me you too. On... Had a great time. thank you thank you for inviting me on and you know and this is great because this is this is the first ever podcast I've done. Really? Yeah, this yeah. is the first one. Right on. Well, yeah. I hope you had a really good time. I had, yeah, great time. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for inviting me on. For sure. Now I have to ask, where can people find you online? Okay, so um, come and find us at Tom and Derek's Drive In. We've got our, we've got yes. our YouTube channel, and uh, and also you'll find me, you know, occasionally throwing out the odd sort of inane tweet on. Twitter, uh, I think my handle is uh, at Tom K Wilton. Um, yes, yeah, and I also I do also have my own YouTube channel as well, yes. um, which I think um, is I think I'm just on there as Tom Wilton. I think. I think. But so. that's my that's my sort of creature, yeah, kind of individual creature performance um, sort of channel, kind of separate from the driving. Yeah, there's some very cool stuff on there. Your reel is very Thanks, cool. Man. Thanks. Thank you. Thank but, you very much. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Good to talk to you, Brian. Thank you. For sure. And...